Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, my name is Michael Schubach, and my topic, is, of course, as introduced, is AI coming to hospitality. And so before I talk about how AI could be working in hospitality, let's talk a little bit generally about what artificial intelligence really is. So we'll go with the dictionary definition to begin. That artificial intelligence is, there we go, is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that usually require human intelligence. So if that's the case, I have a question for the audience. By show of hands, is a calculator an example of artificial intelligence? If you think a calculator is artificially intelligent, raise your hand. Is a calculator not an example of artificial intelligence? If you think it is not artificially intelligent, raise your hand. We probably expect that artificial intelligence is something more than simply computer-assisted data or computer-assisted information. Um, I will admit that calculators do something that most humans can't do. They can find the square roots of numbers, and so that's, that's a fairly good thing that, to have happen. So they are quite intelligent, but a calculator really doesn't have the ability to learn a new math skill while you're asleep. or do something more or take its findings and apply it to another problem. So, so when we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about not only data and parsing of data and data analysis, but we also talk about how those skills can be applied in another sense. And let's talk about that now. My little slide advancer is not doing the, the sub stuff here. Am I good? Oh, here we go. All right. Artificial intelligence breaks down generally into two major categories that people pay attention to. The first is called applied artificial intelligence. Applied artificial intelligence means that it is, it is specifically devoted to a singular task. Um, and I'm showing you the example of the self-driving car here. It's not that it's not complex, it's very complex. And it has lots of variables and, and they're constantly changing all around it. But at the end of the day, your car, your artificially intelligent car, will only drive. It will not suddenly know how to do, cut your lawn or, or do your washing or whatever it is that you want to do. It's a very narrow task field that gets applied to that. What we think of, what we gen generally tend to think of when we talk about artificial intelligence is that brave new world of AGI, which is um, artificial general intelligence. Now you can think Terminator. Here's Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is the, this is the, um, the machine that can actually react to any variety of situations. And so it's out there and it does all kinds of different things. And so if you think if anything that, that smacks of Terminator or iRobot is, is our projection of what we think artificial intelligence should grow to be. But let's talk about that a little bit. So first of all, as I said, the first correlation is artificial intelligence coupled with robotics. So if I do those two things and mash those things together and create something that can move and something that can think, I'm beginning to assemble the dream of artificial intelligence as we know it, which is to, to have that omnipresent being capable of doing many things. That's the first step. The second step is machine learning. Machine learning technically is the ability that machines have to teach themselves. We're beginning to get quite good at machine learning, which is to say, when we talk about machine learning, we talk about machines that, that can learn as distinct from being taught. So if you think of the calculator example, we have to download all of the math principles and so forth that would be a, applied. We give it the mechanics of how to do the job, which means we know how to do the job and we translate those steps into something that a machine can understand. Machine learning is that we don't give instruction, that instead we will connect the machine to the internet, let it look at images, millions of images over time, let it begin to correlate those images, let it begin to um, analyze text, and let it tell you what it has absorbed. So that's the beginning of sort of the artificial intelligence platform is machine learning. There is um, a third stage to that, 
not to my clicker, but to artificial intelligence. There it is. Deep learning. <clears throat> Deep learning is a um, is a corollary of machine learning. And what happens in deep learning is that we begin to apply these techniques. And not only do we learn, but we learn from what we learned. And in other words, we, we come up with a solution. The machine comes up with a solution. It's 80% correct. It figures out why it was wrong. And it comes up, and the next time, it's 95% correct. And then it's 98% correct. Um, and it does this through what I what are considered to be the three cornerstone capabilities of artificial intelligence. The first is text processing, is that machines will learn to read, they'll learn to read, and then they'll begin to assimilate anything that, that is given to them so that they can understand and recall text. So a lot of times, that if you think about Siri, where you say, Siri, I'm looking for a reference to, and Siri comes back and says, OK, here's three things I found. It's just text matching to say, here's what, here's what you said, here's what they said. It uses the second cornerstone of artificial intelligence, which is natural language processing, NLP. Siri, Alexa, um, the, um, uh, Coleman, any of, the, any of the advanced platforms are going to use natural langu language processing, NLP, to take requests. And they can either output in natural language or they can output in conventional reporting forms. So you get that kind of thing going on. And of course, the thing is, is that then what makes this a little different than the rest of them is, is the idea of neural, um, using neural network storage. So neural network storage is the ability to replicate the function of how a human brain stores and recalls data and images. So let's play a quick little game here. I'm going to ask everyone in the audience, I'm going to ask you to recall an image. And what I want you to do is so that you can see that image more clearly if you'll close your eyes. And I'm going to give you a countdown to think of an image. And when you see that image, I want you to raise your hand. But since everyone will have their eyes closed, I also want you to snap your fingers. So as soon as you see the image in your mind, snap your fingers. OK, are you ready? So I'm going to give you a countdown, and we'll go. Three, two, one. Santa Claus. Well, you mostly did pretty good. Some of your little, that finger snapping thing may not have worked exactly right. But here's the deal. Look how fast. How many images do you think you have in your mind? How fast did you recall that image? And I can probably tell you what that image looked like. We probably shared a common image to a large extent. You saw a large, overweight gentleman with a white beard and a red suit, trimmed with white fur, with a black belt and black boots. And I was well, actually, I did this once with an audience, and the woman said, I don't know, I'm alarmed here. My, my image was in black and white. What does that mean? And I said, I don't know, I think you need an upgrade. I'm not sure what that would be. Um, but uh, so you, we, we, we share common images, but we know how to find them. We don't have to go, we don't have to sequentially read through all of the images. I didn't have to qualify to you whether I was thinking person, place, or thing. I didn't have to give you constructs to go find that image, and yet you were able to find it pretty much in the snap of fingers. We can do it again. Let's try it only this time. I'm going to give you, instead of an image, I'm going to give you a description, and I want you to match it to an image. This time is a little different. You can have your eyes open in this one, but when you think you know what I'm describing, to 95% certainty, I want you to raise your hand. When you go to 99% certainty that you know what I'm describing, I want you to raise your other hand. So this is 95, 99, 95, 99. For 95% certainty, I'm going to give you a word list, and you tell me what I'm describing. First word, round. Round. Hot. Flat. Red. Crusty. Doughy. 97, 99. Cheesy, pepperoni, what am I describing? Pizza. 
All right, not bad, but you were pulling those images. What did you see with round? What did you see with red? When did you start to see the pizza? Of those people who raised the two hands and got to 99% certainty, did you, did you change your mind immediately before you were um, from one object to another when you went from 95 to 99? So you were thinking of something immediately that got disqualified and then came back in. All right, that's neural networking. That's keyword searches. That's, it, it seems so obvious to us now because we do that in our technology. This is how our technology is structured. But it's structured to imitate the human brain. And so we want them to think like we do. So that is the curse and the blessing of artificial intelligence. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. I'll give you two dimensions of art, artificial intelligence. When we, these are terms that you'll hear applied to the science in general. Weak and strong, weak and strong artificial intelligence. So that's the one that's running along the bottom there. So what is strong AI? Strong AI, I'm glad you asked me that. Strong AI is, first of all, the concept that I think proceeds is sentience or sentience. Some people say sentience or sentience. What is that? That's self-awareness or consciousness. So the question is, is the, the stronger the machine gets at artificial intelligence, the more sense of self that we expect that machine to embody. So it gives us, we, we begin to move towards the idea that I'm aware, that I'm self-aware and, and I can feel. So the question is, is that a really a, a good piece of artificial intelligence, something that will really mimic the human condition, we'll have some degree of awareness, and we'll have some degree of feeling. Um, after we have awareness, self-awareness, we have the concept of agency. So what is agency? <laughs> Sorry. Agency is the idea that I, I have my own force of will, that I can make free choices. So that was, that's what we tend to think of as a fully sentient being, is one that is aware, and one that can make choices. And so picture, if you will, a, a, an artificial intelligence application where, where you, say to, you say to the computer, computer, I'd like you to analyze these reports for me, please. Now, a sentient computer could turn around and say, you know, I'm just not feeling this today. I'm, I'd rather not. I'm not in the mood. We don't think that they should be doing that, but that is a property of sentience. I can be aware, I can tell you how I feel about it, I may or may not be on the same page with you. The second um, is now agency where I say, hey computer, please analyze these reports for me, and the computer says, no, do it yourself. I have no interest in this project, I'm not doing it. Um, that's free will. And free will is not a highly desirable item of choice and, and something that you're going to have to pay to own, I think, primarily. Now, narrow to broad is what we were talking about in the difference between applied artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence. Applied artificial intelligence is a specific task. So like the Roomba home vacuum cleaner that can run around your home, memorize the floor plan, know where the base is, and every once in a while go out and perform a service. That's applied intelligence. And if it takes intelligence to map itself, know when to quit, know when to recharge, know when to go around certain messes, that's, that's a perfect example of, of an applied uh, use of artificial intelligence. Now when we go broad, we want it, as I said, to do everything. So now I should be able to do a task, a good broad artificial um, intelligence application be, should be able to do a task that it knows nothing about. But it has experiences that it can draw on in order to figure out what it should or shouldn't be doing with, with that particular job. Now, if the world made artificial intelligence very quickly and did it perfectly, we would go from the first to the fourth quadrant here, and we would go in a straight line where we would move from a very narrow, weak application up to a very broad and strong application. This is the Terminator area right up in here, is this guy up here, is that we have, I can take on anything that I want to take on, 
and I, can, and I can assert my own free will in doing it. I can know what I want to do and when I want to do it. And I don't have to be taught and I don't have to be told. And I have, a, I have an opinion about it. That's, that would be true sentience in a machine. Um, I don't think that's actually how artificial intelligence goes. I'm going to guess that in the wonderful world of artificial intelligence, we sit about right here. We can argue about where that star might best be placed. But we're still pretty much in the, in the narrow applications, and we're not anywhere near sentient. The, the, the deal here, is, though, is that the investment is being made up here. So this is where the big money is being spent. Actually, is, is you can look at this and say, if that's the path to the Terminator, this is actually where we're spending money, and this is where we're spending money today. These are where big investments are. Um, Self-driving automobiles sit down here in the narrow, uh, or, sorry, sit down here in, the, in this area. I'm not going to say that they're sentient, but they're going to get highly complex. They're going to deal with highly complex issues. But there's, there, we're trying to strengthen the machines and broaden them. But I don't think we're going to go like this. I honestly think that the path forward is going to look a little bit more like this. I think we will get dangerously close to flirting with strength. I don't know that we will ever make strong uh, machines. One thing that is very different is that the better we are at making artificial intelligence, the more it can assist us in making it better. So the faster it can learn, the more it will assimilate, the better it will get. It will, in theory, make itself better, and so we will get much better, much faster at, at creating these highly useful machines. So the question is, is though, would it work in reciprocal? Would, they, would that make us better? Would we be better people if we had a fleet of these kinds of machines? So I guess the question really would be, are you a better person today because you have this kind of machine? Are you smarter? Are you faster? Are you more efficient? Because you have, how many of us, by the way, have one of these with us right this very moment in time? Yeah, see, there you are. Don't be shy. You all have them. There's maybe two people in here who don't. Um, all right, so the idea is that we do, we like, we like access to information. We like being well informed. We like machines that are capable of giving us a broad range of responses. So we think this is a great thing. Um, but it's something that we have to be careful about. Now, why do I think the path for artificial intelligence is different? And I think this is a big changer here, is, is it even possible to invent strong AI? And, the, and we have, hello, make it go. This part is very tough here. Um, there we go. Is it possible? Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. It's theoretically impossible that we can make sentient free agent machines. The, um, the money is being spent. This is the most exciting part of AI. This is where the development is going. This is where people are spending their money. So it is possible. There is another school that says it is completely impossible. And I sort of tend towards this side of the fence. Sentience is biochemical. And this is the part that people keep forgetting. We are, our emotional, our emotional subjective responses are in large part biochemical and electrical responses. Machines that are being developed today have no biochemistry involved in them. We are, in fact, chemical beings. We're biochemical beings. If you have depression, how do we treat depression? We treat it chemically. We give you drugs. If you're in France, we give you Chardonnay. But it doesn't matter. We treat it with chemicals. Um, and so that's how we fix the problem of sentience. And um, so what we see, though, is emulation. And emulation does not create reality. Watching singing in the rain in your living room does not soak your furniture. It is an emulation of a real situation. It is not the real situation itself. Um, I will also tell you that I oops, here we go up here, come on, is simulating feelings and responding accordingly is called acting. 
There are people who do this eight times a week on Broadway, and we are tremendously moved. We leave, we leave crying or laughing because these people experience something before our eyes. On cue, in response to other dialogue, doing what they do professionally to re elicit a response. There will be machines that get really good at acting and really good at understanding what you seem to be feeling and giving you responses. But it's not because they love you, and it's not because they're as happy to see you as your dog. It's because they're reading responses, and they've been programmed to provide those responses. Um, and, differentiating, and, and they don't have opinions. They, they're differentiation machines a lot, where we'll sit down and say, so for instance, if I say to you, what's better? What is the better answer? Would you, if you win the lotto, you win the lottery and you get, you get a million euros, would you rather have 50,000 euros a year for the rest of your life or would you rather have the million um, euros? Question, so you sit down and, so now that's a fairly maybe opinionated a question. We might all have different answers, but it's not just an opinion. We sit down and say, well, how old are you? How's your health? What's your genetic makeup? What's your background like? What are your goals and aspirations? What do you want to have happen? How do you feel about money? It's a very complex task, but at the end of it, you're going to use your differentiation analytical skills and say, I'll take, I'll take it all in one lump sum, please. I'm not feeling all that well, or whatever it may be. But you come up with why this works for you. It's not an opinion, it's a differentiation. And machines can do that. Machines can do that very well. So it's going to look and feel and act more human-like as time goes on, but it's not going to be a human. In order to change, in order to make a sentient machine, we would have to understand exactly how feelings operate so we can replicate that in machinery or in a chemical. We don't. We don't understand exactly why someone's psychology is different than someone else's. So how, if I can't understand the problem, how do I cre recreate it in the laboratory? How do, what, do I, what am I searching for? And that's why I think sentience in, in artificial intelligence is not likely. It's not likely. But the appearance of sentience will probably be major. Um, there's a lot of opinions out there, as I say, about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, two recent quotes. AI is probably the most important thing humanity has ever worked on. I think it is something more, pro, uh, something more profound than electricity or fire. This is Sundar Pinchai, the CEO of Google. This quote comes to us from about six or eight weeks ago. It is the most important thing humanity has ever worked on. Our buddy Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, has a very different opinion. AI is a fundamental existential risk for human civilization, and I don't think that people fully appreciate that. So here we have the fear of the sentient beings rising to their full potential. Here we have the good servants of mankind making our lives better than we ever dreamed they would be. So there are there are so there's the question out there is artificial intelligence a threat to humanity? Or is it a threat to hospitality? So uh, my answer to that is very clear. Yes, of course it is. I think it's a genuine threat to our way of life and our way of doing business. Why? Well, here's one example. Think of, imagine a robotic arm, army designed to fight our wars for us. What could possibly go wrong in that scenario? And yet, if making war is a completely human attribute. And if you looked at the evidence assembled over the last five millennia, you would say, we are and will always be warlike. Wouldn't the smartest thing you could do in the whole world is to build people to have your wars for you? Build some sort of army to do that? Think of all the veterans who would no longer be wounded. Think of, all, think of, think of how we could avoid lasting monuments of great time and not blow up great 12th century cathedrals, but just simply eliminate those pesky humans that we don't care for. We could do that. But is there a possibility that that could go wrong? That that could fall into to the wrong hands or have the wrong human motivation behind it? Is it possible there could be a leader of the free world who might find a war more interesting than not? 
Not that I, as an American, would ever travel outside of the United States and take a cheap shot at the current administration, but there was nothing cheap about getting here, so I'll take an expensive shot at the current administration. You, want, you would want to be very careful about who controlled these kinds of tools. You would have to think about that a lot. Another example. Hello. Thank you. Oops, oh, too many. Up. Oh. The financial and social implications are currently incalculable, but they're, they're genuinely coming. I think this is the most important thing about artificial intelligence is it is coming like a tidal wave. There is more work, more money, more ingenuity being applied in this area than anything else that's going on in computing today. This is where people go. On the bright side, as I point out, is if there's a mass collateral damage, applied artificial intelligence does less damage. And in other words, if every, if every Roomba home vacuum cleaner goes crazy berserk and tries to vacuum you to death at night, there's only the Roomba uh, owners are at risk there. We can, we can confine that risk. So, so we needn't worry about it too much, but there are risks involved. Um, to finish Elon Musk's concern, robots will be able to do everything better than us. And I will, I'll match him with my own retort, which is, Mr. Musk, what would be the point of making machines that are dumber than us? Why would that be a good idea? That is not a good idea. So we want, we want smart, we want human-like, we want easy to interact with, we want these things. You would think that this is a natural for hospitality, um, and I'm not so sure that it is. But the economic threat that is attached to artificial intelligence is real, and it's coming. Um, the first thing is we don't have to get a lot better at artificial intelligence to have it start replacing people. We do not need sentient, free agent machines to unemploy human beings. We can do that today. Um, that's already out there, and, it, and that is the biggest thing that's coming at us. First to go, as I'm sure you've heard, um, there's been a lot of emphasis on the transportation industry, transportation being part of transportation and tourism. Um, Self-driving cars are coming. Everyone says, no, they're not. Yes, they are. Um, and so we'll get rid of transportation jobs. We'll get rid of logistics. We will get rid of people who are in risky positions. We will get rid of those people that are difficult to insure, those people who injure themselves frequently at work. Those things will go away very quickly. So dangerous jobs will be eliminated. Moving jobs will be eliminated. The driving is one of the most dangerous things that human beings do today. If, if, we had the, if the airline industry had the same safety statistics as the, as the automobile industry, a 747 or a, what is it, an A300, um, an Airbus A380? Yeah, big one, the big one. One of those would go down every eight hours. Would you get on a machine that was where one of them went down every eight hours? And that's deaths only. That is not injuries or anything else. We will kill everyone on a machine. And that happens every day three times a day as a result of automobile fatalities. The smartest thing we could do is stop letting people drive cars. Um, but after we get rid of those people, their managers will go and schedulers. We're already seeing entire industries where they're talking about why do we have people in accounting? There's no reason. Oops, here I gotta go. Um, accountants will go, professionals will go. Finally, um, all of the children, up to 60% of Gen Z's children, Gen Z's, those born after 2001, by the time they're in college, they will be 60% unemployed. That, um, the United States during the height of the Great Depression, the unemployment rate reached 30%. We're talking about 60. So, is it coming to hospitality? Wrong question. When is it coming? What will it do? And, and are we prepared for the impact? When is it coming? It's beating down the door. Um, it's coming right away. What will it do? Uh, this is Savioki's um, Butler. It was introduced in 2015. This is the whiz bang. This is the take the room service order and take it to the room. Why do we like that? We don't like it so much. I'm running over, so I have to go. But you know what? It's cheaper than a room service waiter, and that's why it will prevail. It's always follow the money. We think artificial intelligence is going to do a lot for guest service. I won't be able to tell you about it, but the impact is astronomical. Take a picture of that last slide as I run over and know that the the, the employment that will follow, the unemployment that will follow as a result of the artificial intelligence wave will be astronomical and it will change 
every industry, not just hospitality. I thank you for your time and attention. I hope that was interesting and had something to say to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, oh thanks.